Hello and welcome to another edition of Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks. Our guest on this episode is Chris Hadfield, who made himself world famous in 2013 by being the first astronaut to sing and play the guitar while commanding the International Space Station, orbiting some 250 miles above the Earth. Born in Sarnia, Ontario in 1959, Chris was recognized as an outstanding aircraft test pilot, and prior to becoming the author of three best-selling books, he was also acknowledged as one of the most experienced and respected astronauts in NASA history. Chris, most young boys growing up in Canada during the 1960s probably wanted to be firemen or hockey players. Personally, I wanted to be a PGA Tour player, but that was never going to happen. <laughs> but from what I've read about you, it was astronaut all the way. How come? Uh, Jim, it started, I think, in my mind. I, I, was, I was growing up on a farm, primarily. So I wasn't surrounded by all the opportunity and stimulation of a city, but what I had was books and, and comic books and science fiction books, sort of the, the, to go beyond the horizons of where I lived. And then Star Trek came on television, and that was, I mean, it wasn't Bonanza. This was, this was a Western, but it was in space, and Kirk and Spock and all those characters. And then 2001, A Space Odyssey came out, and that was just, I went to their, a friend of mine's birthday party and that combination of huge opportunity through imagination really got me fired up but at the same time as the firemen and the hockey players were, were stimulating young Canadian kids people were starting to fly in space for real yeah. and it wasn't just fantasy and so there was a link between this wild imagination that was being fed by science fiction and the actual opportunity that might exist for a little kid like me and when they all came together with the first you know, moon landing and the race to the moon in the late 60s, I just felt like uh, this has never happened before. And this is a, a door opening to a previously unattainable world. And maybe I could be one of the people that could go through and do this thing. It just captured my imagination. Well, you and your two brothers were also kind of struck with the idea of spending perhaps a lifetime above the clouds. Uh, because you all became aircraft pilots as young adults, uh, and even as kids, you enrolled in the National Air Cadets program. But even then, how realistic was it to think that maybe one day I, a little Canadian boy here just outside of Sarnia, Ontario, could actually be an astronaut? Uh, it, was, it wasn't unrealistic. It was impossible. Yeah. Because uh, we didn't have astronauts, right? We didn't have a space agency. Canada didn't have rocket ships. We didn't have capsules. We had none of that. But uh, you didn't have to take a very big leap to realize that space flight just a few years previous had been impossible for everybody. When I was born, nobody had, when you were born, no one had ever flown in space. You know, I was two years old when Gagarin and, and Al Shepard flew. So space flight was still brand new. So that made it seem, even though right now, by definition, it wasn't something a little Canadian kid could actually do, I thought, well, not very long ago, those guys, Neil Armstrong couldn't do that either. So I, I can't predict the future, but I really thought maybe I could work on myself. And that's why I and my brothers joined the Air Cadets, to, to try and get that first step away from the world, start to fly and see just uh, how high the future could take us. Before we go on to space with you, uh, let's talk a little bit about your time before you became an astronaut. You became a test pilot for the Canadian Armed Forces, the RCAF, and also for the United States Navy. Tell us a little bit about what you did as a test pilot, the things you accomplished. Yeah, I was a fighter pilot in the Canadian Air Force, uh, flying F-18s, intercepting Soviet bombers during the Cold War off the coast of Canada. And then I got selected to go to test pilot school. I went to the U.S. Air Force test pilot school out in the desert at Edwards where Chuck Yeager had you know, broken the speed of sound and Scott Crossfield had gone Mach 2 and X-15 had flew. And then after that, I got selected and, uh, to go down and be a test pilot on exchange with the United States Navy over the Chesapeake, a little airport called Patuxent River. And I was an F-18 test pilot, but I flew a lot of other airplanes. I get, in my whole life, I've flown about 100 or so different types of airplanes. So we were testing F-18s. It was back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, so uh, the Persian Gulf conflict. And 
uh, trying to make those F-18s better, safer airplanes, but, but also more effective airplanes. Uh, the Navy was putting them out of control and crashing them all over, and so I did a whole out-of-control program with F-18s where we took one up and did things to make it start tumbling through the air and then experiment with different ways to get it back under control. And we put a hydrogen-burning engine on the wingtip of the F-18 uh, that someday may lead to the type of aircraft that could take you halfway around the world in a couple hours. Uh, a uh, supersonic combustion ramjet, a scramjet. So it was partially military testing, but also partially just straight aerodynamics testing and a lot of scientific research. It was, it was a fascinating job. And if I hadn't had you know, the next step up to be an astronaut, I would still be a test pilot. I, I love that job. So how did you get into the uh, astronaut stream? What, uh, how did you qualify? Uh, there was no path from where I started to where I wanted to end up. There, were, there was no one to follow in Canada. There were no role models. All my role models were uh, Soviet or American. But they were pilots, and a lot of them were test pilots, and so that's the route, and engineers, so that's the route I'd chosen. But when Canada started selecting astronauts in the 80s, and then again in, in 1992, they were looking for people with operational skills, people who'd done complex things, people with uh, advanced academic backgrounds, people with healthy bodies, you know, all the standard sort of thing you picture for an astronaut. And so I, I put together the best resume I could possibly do. And, you know, I bought the expensive paper and, and uh, made sure it was shipped on the best shipping to make sure it got there in time. It tried to list every single thing I'd done. But there were 5,300 and odd other people yeah. that applied at the same moment. But I think the work that I'd done since I was that nine-year-old kid watching Neil and Buzz step onto the moon had, had given me um, a, an, an accretion of, of, I don't know, capabilities and qualifications that, uh, that my name kept making it to the top of the pile. And then there was a final week where they brought the last 20 of us out of 5,300. And they looked as far into our bodies but also into our minds as they could, making sure that we were fundamentally healthy but also, uh, this is a 20-year commitment, and you're going to be asked to risk your life, and lots of your compatriots are going to die doing this job. And, and are you the right type of person to, to be able to do all those super complex things, but also represent your country? And it was an exhaustive week, but at the end of it, they chose four of us, uh, and I was one of those four. And there have since been another five Canadians who have gone to space. Yes. Uh, you weren't the first. I guess Mark Garneau and Roberta Bondar were the first two Canadians. That's right. And you and Julie Payette, who is now, of course, our Governor, Governor General. General. That's right. Um, but the Americans didn't have to allow Canadians into the program, did they? But they did. How did that all happen? Yeah, Canada has never built a rocket that can take a human being to space. So any time a Canadian has flown in space, it's been in cooperation with another space agency, another country, or both. Uh, back at the beginning of when, as you say, Mark Garneau, Roberta Bonder, Steve McLean flew, uh, we had provided the big robot arm for the American Space Shuttle. And since we had a, a major, important, necessary component of the Space Shuttle program, that allowed us a few people to be part of the program. And that's, those were our first astronauts, very much um, scientists on board the shuttle. But when we started building the International Space Station, and we'd proven ourselves as to be a good partner with the Canada Arm and, and our astronauts, we were invited to not just be scientists on board, but actually to be full, uh, completely qualified crew members to do anything anybody else might have to, operate the big arms or do spacewalks or whatever. And that was the hiring plan in 92, when Julie and, and Mike and Dave and I were hired. And I immediately got shipped down, along with Mark Garneau, actually, the two of us, down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'd visited there as a teenager, you know, dreaming that someday I might have a chance to come work here. And so it was a pretty amazing day on August the 3rd, 1992, when I got in my, my old family station wagon, because we had three kids, and drove through the gates of the Johnson Space Center realizing that this great new adventure of life was, was, a dream was just come beginning. True. Yeah, but it was, yeah. it was more than a dream come true. It was, it was like the start of a long imagined dream. And, and the details had yet to be worked out. Like a familiar novel where you've just started turning the page and you know it's gonna be great, but you just don't know how yet. 
let's talk about some of the details. You did three separate space missions. Mm -hmm. Give us some of the numbers, the, the total number of days in space. Uh, you don't count those while you're in space, uh, but uh, I think old. someone counted. It's a little under half a year. I think it's wow. 165, 166 days or something like that. Uh, about uh, 2,650 times around the world. I think that's about 70 million miles. Uh, uh, you get 16 sunrises a day, so if you're going to multiply 166 times 16, that's how many extra sunrises and sunsets I've seen. What was yeah. the longest stretch? My first flight, we were helping build the Russian space station Mir, on a, went up on a space shuttle, Atlantis. We were only up for eight days. Second flight, I was doing spacewalks to build the International Space Station. That was a little more complex. We were up about a dozen days. But my third flight, I flew uh, as the pilot of a Russian spaceship, a Soyuz. And it's a taxi that takes you to the station, and then, then you, you live there. And we lived there for five months. So my third flight was the long one, five months living on board the International Space Station with our little Soyuz parked there as a lifeboat if we needed it, but also like a, like a, uh, a horse that's been tied up outside waiting until you get back on and, and head back home again. And so if I'd scripted it, it couldn't have been better because I had those first two flights to really learn what was going on, to get accomplished, to learn how to be a good technical astronaut, but how to be a leader, and then to be asked after all of that, to go live in space for five months and, and command a crew, it was a huge privilege and, and, uh, and I loved every second of it. What were some of the things that you were the, either the first to do or that you alone have done in space? Gosh, uh, well as a Canadian, because there's only been a, a handful of us fly in space, almost everything you do is the first, you know, but, but I, I, I don't know, I was the first mission specialist, meaning a fully qualified shuttle crew member. I was the first Canadian to operate the Canada Arm. Yep. I was the first Canadian to do a walk in space. We celebrated on our $5 bill. You know, that, that's a, I, I unveiled that bill in space for the, for the Bank of Canada. Uh, I was the f only Canadian to command a spaceship so far, uh, to, to live on the, board the, the International Space the Station, space station. and yep. be the commander of the International yep. Space Station. So lot, lots of things are first. But What's more important, realistically, for me, Jim, is they, every single one of those was the first time for me. You know, and you can let history decide whether it's uh, a worth, worthy thing or not, but the responsibility of each of those things, the, the import of doing them badly was huge. The life or death and financial risk of making a mistake, is, it's kind of staggering. Billion dollar mistakes and instantaneous death for seven people kind of thing. So. You take it hugely seriously, and afterwards, if you go, "Hey, you were the very first Canadian to do that," go, "Well, that's that's great, and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm proud." But I and wasn't I'm proud thinking for my of country, but that really wasn't the reason that I yes. did it, nor was it uppermost in my mind while it was happening. Sure, you've been described as uh, probably the most savvy social media right. astronaut in history. Not that there's really a category for that. <laughs> it's becoming but, bigger with time. I think. Well, for sure, actually, I think you started a trend, but. You were constantly one of the most celebrated astronauts ever to be in space, mm -hmm. and partly because of the marvelous cover you did of uh, the David Bowie song, Space, uh, space Major Oddity. Tom, yeah, Major space Tom. Oddity. Yeah. But by the time you were up there, I don't think there's any question that the mass public uh, appeal and support of space travel had diminished quite a bit from the you know, the, the Armstrong Aldrin days, of sure. course. In view of the important work that you were doing, the groundbreaking work that you were doing, was it really disappointing with the fact that there just weren't as many people interested and in watching as there had been a generation before? Not at all. I mean, if you'd been there to entertain people, perhaps you would have been disappointed. I was exploring the rest of the universe in person. Uh, you know, in. Gosh, in any movie theater, there are more people sitting there than have ever flown in space. You know, it's still an extremely rare human experience. And I've got to be doing those things. I wasn't there so that I could come home and brag about it yeah. or, or, you know, try and give other people transient entertainment. We forget, uh, by the time Apollo 13 happened, Apollo 11, when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon, by the time Apollo 13 happened, the people that just wanted to be entertained by space, I were like, well, we already went to the moon. Why would we ever go back again? Yeah. Uh, 
and you know, then any, who remembers anything of Apollo 16? You know, it was a hugely important scientific flight. People risked their lives to do it, but the the sort of the aura of entertainment had already washed away. That's normal. That's normal pattern. How about the the 50th person to climb Everest? It it wasn't that much easier than when Sir Edmund Hillary went. Of course, but but it was not nearly as, as publicly celebrated. Or if you come fifth in the Olympics, you worked really hard, and it was a huge accomplishment, but, but, uh, but the entertainment value is low. But fortunately, that's not why we're exploring space, and it's not why the astronauts are in the business. Let me ask, while you were up there, aside from all the tasks that you had to do, what was the biggest challenge for you personally, living through those weeks and months? Uh, and I'm there, thinking there, no, no. There's a lot of challenges, Jim. Or oh, oh, boredom. It's the opposite of boredom. Concentration. Keeping up, keeping the, up, is the hardest thing. Uh, th there are seven point whatever seven point seven billion human beings. Six of them are off the planet, and so everything that's going to be done off the planet has to be done by those six people. Right now, there are just three, in fact. So not just maintaining and operating the most complex spaceship we've ever built but doing the hundreds of experiments on board, um, being sort of the, the focal point of the world space programs and trying to carry that off properly, um, being cognizant and ready for all of the dangers that can crop up at any second. And I had the added responsibility of being the commander of the ship. So as things went wrong, uh, you know, it was up to me to decide. Uh, I had the ultimate vote on whatever was going to happen. And nothing goes as planned. Everything's different, and none of the simulators are perfect, and, and everyone is over-optimistic, and then the queen wants to talk to you, and then something breaks, and, and then, you know, there's just, there's life sure. up there. And nowhere does it ever say, go to the bathroom, or go look out the window, or uh, notice what's happening around you, or, 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 you know, record space oddity. Nowhere does it ever say, love the experience. And so the hardest part for me was, staying ahead of, of the demands, but still loving and absolutely reveling in the experience of being there. I worked really hard at both. But let me ask this. You're cooped up there in a large tin can with four or five or six other people for weeks and months at a time. How difficult is it not to get on each other's nerves or in fact find you can't stand one another? Um, Fortunately, we don't uh, run into strangers very often when we're on board a spaceship. Um, when I first got hired as an astronaut, August of 92, and the 24 of us sat down um, for that group picture, even then I was looking around going, uh, I'm going to be in space with some of these people. And I may have to save the life of any of these people, or they may have to save mine. It's time to start building relationships now. Of respect and trust and camaraderie. And that circle of people just grew with the rest of the American astronaut corps, but then with the International Space Station, the Europeans and the Japanese and the Russians. And a con constant decadal effort to build all of the bridges of support and familiarity, mutual goal setting, uh, an understanding of success, all, all of that in preparation for the inevitability of flying with a subset of them. So that by the time you got to space, you knew each other. You trusted each other. You knew everybody's weaknesses, everybody's strengths. You understand what the purpose was. Um, and you found a way to, to build great joy of celebration into what we were all doing together. In the movies, it's so bad. Everyone's so <laughs> sad in the movies. You, gosh, why is everyone so glum on a space flight? It's, it can be so joyful. and. I mean, you're seeing the entire world every 92 minutes, and, and, and the universe is around you. It's, it's wondrous. And I worked really hard, especially as the commander, to build that esprit de corps and that sense of magnificence of where we were. One of the aspects of your being up there, while you were up there, you were always very proud to be Canadian. It took great pains to remind the people down on Earth that you were Canadian and, indeed, a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, because right. you wore the Leafs jersey, good for you. I did. Even though you'd been living in the United States for many years, what caused you to have so much pride in being Canadian, and what indeed does being Canadian mean to you? 
uh, growing up, I, I didn't see much difference between uh, Canadians and the rest of the world. I mean, it was, it was my sphere of reference, right? I know what it's sort of like. And I, even I have only lived in little parts of Canada. There's lots of Canada I, I don't know well. But I tended to impose my particular view of normal on wherever I was. But the longer you live somewhere else, the more you realize, oh, there are subtle differences. And there are strong, subtle differences between the culture of the United States and the culture of Canada. I boil it down to Canadians are raised with a fundamental trust in authority. Americans are raised with a fundamental mistrust of authority. And I think that manifests itself a lot of different ways. It comes from having uh, a different birth as a nation. The United States fought its way through revolution into becoming a country. Canada was granted over a gosh, 30 year period to, to become a nation. And so we reflect our own pasts. I would, I was born Canadian, I would rather be Canadian. It, 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 I, it suits me better, I like it better. But the United States, there's no country on earth that has opportunity like the United States. And they were the ones that gave me the opportunity to be the test pilot that I was and to have a chance to fly in space three times. So I'm, I'm eternally thankful to the cooperation between the two, but I'm fiercely proud of being a Canadian and, and proud of them. My, my great grandfather was a physical trainer for the Maple Leafs in the late 30s. And, and so how, how can I not be a Maple Leafs fan? So I've always been a Toronto yeah, yeah. Maple Leafs fan as well. Chris, uh, let's go ahead 200 years. With all the problems on Earth today, it's hard to believe that, in, that the space program will even continue, but let's say it does. Do you see us in 200 years perhaps living on another planet or visiting other planets? I mean, I know there's Mars in, in the future, but sure. literally, will humankind be able to exist somewhere else in the universe? And as, as an astronaut, uh, I'm perhaps more personally informed about the world than a lot of people. Been around it so many thousands of times and seen it directly. I'm, I'm much maybe more optimistic than the picture you just painted also. If you go back, you said 200 years from now, you know, how about 200 years ago trying to predict how far we've come since then or, or 200 years before that or any 200 year slice in history. The existential threat to being a success as a species and as a planet has always been wicked and yet we've prevailed like never before. So I am optimistic. You, you also have to be optimistic to fly a rocket ship, but that's okay. So yes, uh, I think we'll find a way to muddle through. I, I think the combination of our own cleverness and creativity and the technology that supports us will, will continue. Um, and I don't think it's gonna stop. Uh, in fact, if anything, I think it will accelerate. So given that, we've already put people on the moon. 12 people, 24 people have gone to the moon, 12 have walked on the surface. Our robots have been driving around Mars since the 70s. We have sent robots to every planet in the solar system and beyond, even beyond our solar system. We have probes that have left our solar system. They're in the space between the stars, interstellar space right now. Um, and it seems crazy that we could be living on the moon or living on Mars. But in 1911, the very first person got to the South Pole. Just 1911. There are people alive right now that were born before that. One long lifetime since, uh, since Roald Amundsen walked, walked on, the, uh, on the South Pole. And now thousands of people live there. And, and so to think that that can happen in just one human lifetime, all you really need is the right technology to be able to stay there. 11 million people a day fly in airliners in a poisonous, unlivable environment going 500 miles an hour. But our technology is so good that, that people sort of take that for granted. So to think that somehow uh, there's a natural barrier to that at the top of our atmosphere or somewhere, I think is just sort of limited thinking. I'm very confident that within that short period of time, we'll be having people live on the moon just as they do in the more remote parts of the world and we'll be figuring out ways for them to be uh, living wherever our rockets will take us, I including Mars. You retired seven years ago. Would you ever want to go back up like John Glenn did 36 years after his last mission? I'd love to fly in space again, but not just for a ride. I wouldn't turn it down if you're offering, Jim. I'd love to go in space <laughs> again. But the real grand benefit of it is the challenge and the adventure and what you learn from it and what it brings back to everybody else not just the personal 
stimulation of nerve endings and fun. It is fun. It's a great experience. But, but it's the big picture that I'm most interested in. And, and it's why I'm talking to you today. And it, it's what directs most of the things I'm doing in my life now. Well, what you've brought back to Earth <clears throat> has benefited so many people. The experience, the tales that you've brought back, and you are a, an exemplary Canadian. So thanks so much for joining us on Canada Files. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Nice to talk with you. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again on the next episode of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of the Browning Watt Foundation, as well as the following donors, the John and Jocelyn Barford Family Foundation, Mary Alice Davis, in memory of Glenn W. Davis, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, Richard and Donna Ivey, Alice and Ted Kernahan, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Andrew and Valerie Pringle, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the Sonner Foundation, William E. Wilder, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.